Greetings, and today we're going to talk about extinction events. Now, why are those important at all? Especially if you're interested in something like personal finance, for example. Well, the accelerating rate of change pervades everything that we do today in the modern world. We are hitting the steeper parts of the accelerating rate of change and being cognizant of how the accelerating rate of change goes back billions of years before technology, before humanity, even before any life forms that we would recognize today is important. Why? Because I want everyone watching this to have a holistic understanding of how the accelerating rate of change is coded into the very DNA of life. And then you will understand how the accelerating rate of change gave rise to modern technology and how we are under an accelerating rate of technological and economic progress even in the modern world. We're already in the early foothills of the technological and economic singularity. So to understand things like personal finance, including why, for example, technology equities will keep outperforming, whereas commodities like oil, gold, and silver will not do very well. These two subjects are in fact related, and I will have a number of videos on this channel about why that is. But a holistic understanding of the accelerating rate of change is crucial to truly grasping the interconnectedness of all of these subjects and therefore the first principles of technology, economics, evolution, biology, and in some ways the mechanisms of the universe itself. And so with that grand preamble, let us get started over here. So on Wikipedia, you see the article for extinction event, which I'll have in the description box below. An extinction event is defined as something where a large portion of all life on Earth, 99 plus percent of all individual life forms and 90 percent of all species and sometimes entire categories of species, entire varieties of creatures have been eliminated, never to return again. And this tells us something about not just evolution, but the recovery from these extinction events and the speed of recovery and how all life and evolution and more importantly, the evolution of intelligence returns to the trend line, all tell us something about the deep seated code of life and the accelerating rate of change as something that governs not only evolution, but basically everything about our world today. So keeping it simple, there have been a number of these extinction events, but we're going to focus on just two for the purposes of this video. We are going to focus on the biggest one that ever happened, where my cursor is right now, the Permian-Triassic extinction event, 252 million years ago, and the most famous one that ever happened, the Cretaceous-Paleogene extinction event, 66 million years ago. But now before we go to the first extinction event, a note on the charts and the difference between linear versus accelerating rates of change. This chart only accounts for the last 542 million years from the Cambrian explosion to the present. And the second of the two that I'm going to talk about, the Cretaceous Paleogene event, looks very close to the present. However, brief sidebar over here, I pull up this chart, which is also in my Atom publication in the first chapter, the prologue. If you consider the beginning of life on Earth, which was very shortly after the Earth itself formed 4.5 billion years ago, the first 4 billion out of those 4.5 were very primitive. The life that existed then seemed to evolve very slowly because this was the earliest part of the accelerating rate of change. Only the last 540 million years from the Cambrian explosion onward is called the Phanerozoic Eon, and that is expanded. You see, this section is now expanded and exploded into these smaller divisions. And now we're going through the Paleozoic era and the two extinction events we're going to talk about today actually bookend the Mesozoic era. The first one, 252 million years ago, and the second one, 66 million years ago. So two big reset buttons for all life on Earth and how evolution had to redirect in entirely different directions. And that's how we're going to frame the discussion today. The two bookends of the Mesozoic era are what we're looking at. And both are very recent compared to the entire history of the Earth. This orange zone over here is actually the distance between those two extinction events. And that's why the more recent one looks even closer to the present than it is now, even though that was 66 million years ago. But with that sidebar and some intro about how the accelerating rate of change and a logarithmic scale applies, we go back to the extinction event article on a linear scale. So now clicking ahead to the first extinction event, the Permian Triassic, you can see here how it describes certain things on Wikipedia. 57% of all biological families and 83% of all genera became extinct. That means entire categories of creatures, entire types of organisms became extinct. And this happened a long enough time ago that the recovery was slow. This was earlier in the accelerating rate of change. 
And therefore, that is a lesson for why the recovery took so much longer. It took, by many accounts, 10 years for life to fully recover, and the species that existed after the extinction event were, of course, very different, as we shall see. So, not to go through the whole Wikipedia article, but geologically you can see evidence across the world of a boundary between the period immediately before the extinction event, the Paleozoic era, and the period immediately after, the Mesozoic era, 252 million years ago. And the causes of the impact event are not known. Because it was so long ago, it is most likely a large asteroid hitting the Earth because that was the cause of the next one we were going to talk about. But we don't know because since it was so long ago, the evidence that could have existed is pretty much erased. Even large craters don't last for more than 200 million years in many cases because the Earth's crust has a 200 million year turnover period. So even though we did figure out that the next extinction event I'm going to speak about was because of a large asteroid, we don't know if that's the reason for this one, which was much further back in time. However, it's safe to assume something similar to a large asteroid occurred, some large natural disaster. It was not necessarily a very gradual extinction because of the scale of destruction. But the greatest breadth and depth of extinctions that ever happened happened in this particular extinction event. And the way evolution redirected became very, very different. For that, I flipped to this other chart. This chart is also from Wikipedia, and it is also not linear, of course. But you can see here, the bookend between the Paleozoic and Mesozoic, very dramatic change. It was a mass extinction of fishes. The variety of fish species used to be very wide, as you can see from where the cursor is here, and it became a lot less. Amphibians also did not see a huge reduction in the variety of species at the time, but the larger ones went extinct much more so than the smaller ones. And reptiles, which were almost nothing at the time of this extinction event, became far, far, far more dominant. We know of those as dinosaurs, and they emerged somewhat after the extinction event in the middle of the Triassic period. But as you can see, this reset effect had occurred. Mass extinction of fishes, dramatic displacement of amphibians with reptiles 252 million years ago, forming the boundary between the Paleozoic and Mesozoic era in terms of our geological classification. By many accounts, it took 10 million years after this event for life to recover because it was, once again, not as far along in the accelerating rate of change as we are today or even as was the case 66 million years ago. Therefore, the emergence of actual dinosaurs was in fact several million years after this event, as you can see. Now, since we're on this chart, we proceed to speak about the second major extinction event that we will discuss in this video, which is the much more famous one. It was less severe in that the totality of extinction was not as much as the one 252 million years ago, but it's more famous from the human point of view because the dinosaurs went extinct and dinosaurs are well known. A lot of the Paleozoic creatures that went extinct are less familiar to mainstream audiences, but dinosaurs being much more familiar, therefore this extinction event, while not as extreme in scale, although still pretty severe, is the more famous one. 66 million years ago, marking the end of the Mesozoic era and the start of the Cenozoic era. So back now to the main Wikipedia article going to this relatively recent one, Cretaceous Paleogene Extinction Event, clicking on that link. You can read about more details about this, but what is interesting is how upfront in the article it says a very important detail, which is, with the exception of some ectothermic species such as sea turtles and crocodilians, no tetrapods, meaning four-legged creatures, weighing more than 25 kilograms, 55 pounds, survived. Now that is very important. This extinction event, which as we saw, was not as big as the one 252 million years ago, was still big enough to pretty much wipe out all large creatures above the size of a Labrador retriever, perhaps, other than a couple of things like sea turtles and crocodilians. Remember, all the large creatures in the world were reptiles at the time. Not only on land, the dinosaurs, but the oceanic reptiles, which are not technically categorized as dinosaurs, but were also reptiles, they went extinct as well. The asteroid that hit what is today the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico was six miles or 10 kilometers in diameter and kicked up so much debris that the sun was effectively blocked out for about 10 years and entire ecosystems collapsed. The only types of creatures that maybe could survive were those that could eat the corpses of other dead creatures or eat fungus. So detritivores and fungivores effectively. Therefore, this reset button was also extremely substantial, even though it was not as big as the one 252 million years ago. But since this was further along in the accelerating rate of change, the recovery was very fast. 
all the vacant ecological niches, all the vast surface area of the land and the volume of the ocean on the earth were repopulated. There was a tremendous diversity of new species that had come forth within just 100,000 years by many accounts. And not just little rodent-like creatures, but larger mammals also emerged pretty quickly because there was an entire new world to populate again. So the point is the recovery was quite a bit quicker because this is steeper in the accelerating rate of change. The DNA of life had more complex algorithms in it. And despite 99.9% .9 of individual life forms dying and a huge fraction of all species dying, the recovery was so fast that things reverted back to the trend line. And the evolution of intelligence, the accelerating rate at which more and more intelligent creatures emerged and the most intelligent creature in the world at any given time kept rising in intelligence, got faster and faster, leading to the evolution of humans, which I talk about in this video linked up here in the tile right above. Now, why does this matter to your life at all if this happened 66 million years ago and 252 million years ago, respectively? Well, a holistic understanding of the accelerating rate of change has direct relevance given how steep of a part of the curve we are in. Now the rate of change is so fast that major changes occur within one human lifetime. This affects technological progress, technological disruption, and even finance. For example, the stock market, no matter how many corrections keep occurring, it still recovers and makes new all-time highs after a certain amount of time because we are now getting to the early foothills of the singularity. It won't take 10 or 14 or 20 years to recover from a stock market crash. The time it takes to make new all-time highs might be considerably shorter. It might be three to five years in some cases. New categories of assets keep emerging as well. Technology continues to become a larger and larger percentage of the world GDP. Therefore, investing your money, obviously bit by bit, dollar cost averaging and so forth, but investing your money into technology-based equity properties is a much more sound strategy than investing in low-tech companies and certainly more so than investing in things like commodities, gold, silver, and other such commodities that a surprisingly large number of people still believe in. Similarly, the need for exponentially rising quantitative easing, which I talk about in my Adam publication, is very obvious when you study all dimensions of the accelerating rate of change, understand the logarithmic nature of time and why we are at a phase within the grand flow of time where technology is progressing at such a speed as to cause so much technological deflation as to be exponential and therefore the amount of central bank monetary easing that occurs can in fact be rising at a very high compound annual rate, 16 to 24% a year, I say. And so far I have been right in all my predictions about that going back five or six years from the Atom thesis or even 15 years going back through all of the futurists. It's not that complicated. You just have to be a very avid student of the accelerating rate of change. And this video, while seemingly very unrelated to things like personal finance and investment return, is part of the fundamental foundation of knowledge as I repeat again, to achieve a holistic understanding of the accelerating rate of change. And there's a lot of reading that one can do around this. I'll have some resources in the link and all these Wikipedia articles to go in more detail. We'll make this video very long. But this is just one of the subtopics within that entire body of knowledge. Now, if you like this type of content, then I encourage you to upload this video and subscribe to this channel. Thank you very much for watching. There's more to come in the near future.